is in colonial America. And more startling. A gruesome discovery is made in Ben Franklin's basement and revealed for the first time on television. I never thought it could happen to me. ...is in back rooms to implement their great democratic experiment. They were the insurgents. They were the terrorists. They were trying to overthrow the establishment. I mean, in reality, that's what they were. And unlike the heroic portrayals of revolution, Mason Sam Adams and John Hancock played dirty to secure independence for the colonies. They were the ones that would burn the houses down. They were the ones that would drag out the Tories, tar and feather them, and ride them out of town on a rail. They would go to newspapers who were not backing the revolution, and they would break their printing presses. They were also Freemasons. Midnight, 1773. The Green Dragon Tavern, a bar and Masonic lodge, is closed. But a faint light in a back room reveals men, including Masons John Hancock and Joseph Warren, are leading a secret meeting. They're planning a party, a Boston Tea Party. The uh, Green Dragon Tavern, which was sort of ground zero for revolutionary planning in Boston. So it was definitely a conspiracy by a secret organization that got the American Revolution going. And in 1776, when the Founding Fathers gathered to sign the Declaration of Independence, that same secret organization shadowed every move the Founding Fathers made. Who decided where, when, and how these building blocks of freedom should be laid? What symbols of their secret allegiances might be hidden in plain sight? The cornerstone of Philadelphia's Independence Hall was laid by Freemasons in 1734, built on land purchased by Mason William Allen, surveyed by Mason Edmund Woolley, erected by Mason Thomas Bode. And when the Liberty Bell tolled on July 8, 1776, it was rung by Andrew McNair, a Mason. There is something very odd that those people came together at that time, almost as though, if you were prone to believe in such things, that God wanted it that way. And for the last two centuries, historians and researchers have uncovered stories hints that the final words of encouragement that pushed the Founding Fathers to sign the Declaration came from a mysterious otherworldly figure circulating in the gallery. An individual whom they called the Professor stood up in the balcony and told them, look, this is it, you've got to do it. No one was ever able to identify the Professor. He disappeared as quickly as he had arrived. Could it be that the signing of the Declaration of Independence came at the urging of a figure from another realm? I believe it is possible for an individual without a physical body to influence a being that has a physical body. In other words, they used to call that overshadowing, and I believe that happened. Another important and rarely discussed influence on the founders was their addiction to mind-altering substances. Well, it's important to understand that in the 18th century, drinking water could be downright dangerous and it might actually kill you because of the parasites that were in tainted water supplies. So it's not unreasonable to think that the big ideas and the, the kind of revolutionary fervor that emerges out of secret meetings that are plied with alcohol was fed by booze. I think that the founding fathers must have been stoned and plastered during that whole period. Beer, whiskey, and wine flowed freely. But was another kind of contraband fueling a new America? Hemp, early American marijuana. When I found out about hemp, it was totally a surprise. 
Uh, the Declaration of Independence was drafted on hemp paper. The Constitution is on hemp paper also. And so are most of our early founding documents from all the states. That thin, crisp paper that Bibles are printed on, that's hemp paper. In addition to our documents, our first flag was on sailcloth, all of which was made from hemp. Even the clothes on the colonials' backs were made from hemp. It was a very patriotic thing during the war to be clothed in homespun. Benjamin Franklin, the, the whole idea was when he went to Europe and was wearing homespun, that was hemp. That was 100% hemp. Homespun has never been anything but hemp. The founding fathers all grew hemp. Thomas Jefferson not only invented a new method for breaking down the fibers in the plant, he brought back newer and stronger strains from a seed collecting trip to France. Thomas Jefferson actually said, there's no greater thing you can do for a country than to add a useful plant to its culture. He was probably looking all over the world for the right hemp to grow in Virginia. He was really into hemp. George Washington said many times over, make the most of the hemp seed and grow it everywhere. He had a 40 acres in the, in the south of his property that, uh, that grew hemp. Hemp was the single most useful crop in colonial America. Sails, ropes, flags, banners, uniforms, log books, all that was made out of hemp. So it took 80 tons of hemp to outfit one sailing ship. And that, that 80 tons meant 350 acres of hemp had to be grown just for one sailing ship. Are they smoking it? Uh, a banned substance today, uh, a plant that gets you high, uh, was something that was smoked regularly by the Founding Fathers. So the, the whole, you know, the Founding Fathers, in addition to being drunk all the time, may have been high. But ultimately, the drug the Founding Fathers had the most success with wasn't hemp. It was tobacco. We know now that tobacco is like the most addictive drug there is. And we got England hooked on it, and they loved it, and they couldn't have enough. Two or three times as much money could be made by growing tobacco. So tobacco was the number one crop in early, early America. And really, uh, drugs started our country. Besides hemp production, George Washington had other secrets that paint a far different picture than the classic poses we are so familiar with. George Washington had a tremendous reputation both as a leader on the battlefield uh, and as a lover in the bedroom. From my research, I found, indeed, there was a group that I call the Founding Girlfriends. There were at least nine women during the war who could say, in all honesty, that George Washington slept here. One of Washington's supposed lovers was Kitty Green, the wife of Nathaniel Green one of Washington's most trusted generals. She was like, uh, you know, a Revolutionary War groupie. She always went to the battles, and Nathaniel Green was telling her, stay home, stay home like the other wives. At six foot two inches, Washington towered above most men of his day. He was an imposing figure and magnetic on the dance floor. This is Kitty Green's dance card from one particular ball during the Revolutionary War. Every dance was promised to General Washington. Strangely, this is the same night Kitty's husband, General Green, was called away by Washington for a secret midnight mission to meet a man in a distant county. The man never showed up, and Green wrote it was a wild goose chase. Now, there are those who imply that uh, there was some hanky-panky going on, and uh, there are others who might say that uh, Washington was merely discussing his strategy for the next battle with Kitty Green. Uh, two points of view. But I, 
I, being a humanist, think that Washington, having been away from Martha for so long, may have had other thoughts other than the campaign strategy. And do the Founding Fathers also have hidden agendas at work in our most sacred documents? It's no accident that, that Masons are there and that they're heavily involved. This in colonial America. And more Star Trek.